Hadis, and welcome to The Arab and Thriving Show, where we're going to explore personal growth, well-being, all through the lens of me, an Arab woman. I'm Rima, your host, and I'm just so, so, so excited because my birthday is coming up in three days. Hopefully, you are listening to this, or if you're on YouTube, you are watching this on my birthday, so feel free to comment below and send your Libra fave some birthday wishes. <laughs> but I like to gift myself something in the form of creation every year on my birthday. I actually started my first like platform slash blog when I was 25, five years ago, because I'm turning 30 on my birthday. And so it just felt right to kind of start this new series on my birthday. And, you know, in light of me turning the big 30, I really wanted to just reflect on five things i was like i'm not about to be like 20 things i learned in my 20s or 30 things i'm learning before 30 because less is more but i'm literally just gonna go over five of the biggest lessons that i've learned and i'm honestly still learning as i kind of close the chapter on my 20s and make way for my thriving 30s is what i like to call them so we're just gonna jump right into it and hopefully you'll learn a little bit more about my journey for the last decade because it's been a wild one so the first lesson that my 20s taught me is to just let some things be unpredictable so i know a lot of the girlies like want someone want to be in a relationship with someone who's unpredictable or like the spontaneity of life and just like being surprised and i'm really not one of those people i hate unpredictable things i hate unpredictable i don't want to say i hate like i really don't feel safe or comfortable around people who are unpredictable. Like I always say, mind you, baddies, I live in LA. This is like a, a side note, but I live in LA and you're gonna hear some like city sounds, maybe or maybe not. I don't know if the mic will catch them, but hopefully you feel like you're in the city with me. So as I was saying, like I always say, like I have to be able to know like what you are and aren't capable of. And the second I feel like I don't know what someone's capable of, I really lose that sense of safety and trust. But what I'm learning is that I can't predict everything. And I know that that sounds so freaking obvious, but please just bear with me. And I'm going to constantly kind of like draw from being an Arab woman. And I'm sure a lot of different people can also resonate with this. We were taught from such a young age to kind of like think about our future and think about our career path and think about when we want to get married and when we want to have kids. And so it kind of forced us to be in this constant mode of planning and projecting out into our future. And so that coupled with also like some life events that I've had. So I lost my dad very unexpectedly. And my whole hypothesis over the past few years has been that like that trauma has led me to be even more fixated on trying to predict what happens so whether i'm watching like binge watching selling sunset or you know one of these random love is blind type shows i'm always like i wonder what's gonna happen i wonder who's gonna stay together and it's like that's cute and funny but then it also kind of translated to things in life like I wonder, you know, what I'm going to do in the next two years or this is what I want to plan out step by step. And when things obviously do not go as planned because they very often don't go as planned, it would kind of throw me off and sometimes spiral me into a really low place. And so when it comes to career, when it comes to personal life goals, when it comes to relationships, I'm learning to just let some things be unpredictable. I think planning and being strategic and being intentional has its time and place. I also think God has all the time and place. And if there's anything, anything that is like the underlying theme between what I learned um, in my 20s, it's just that leave room for God to humble you because you can predict things all day long, but sometimes the plan that is going to end up unfolding the way it was meant to is so much better than anything you could have ever predicted. And that's kind of been the theme in my relationship too with Ahmed. I didn't predict that I would be with someone like Ahmed. I've known Ahmed for like over 10 years. My image of who I wanted to be with looked a little bit different. And when I think about it now, I'm like, I would not get along with that person. Like, I would not get along with that person. And there's other reasons for that too. It kind of like stems from not really actually knowing yourself as well as you think that you know yourself. And so when you leave room for unpredictability, sometimes you're surprised in a way that is so much better than anything you could have dreamt up. And so I keep saying in this phase of my life, God is giving me the life that I didn't even know to dream of. 
So we're going to close that first one on that note. The second lesson that I have learned in my 20s is to lean into my strengths and honestly just give myself permission to let go of some of my weaknesses. Now, to any of you who are super ambitious, high achievers, I hear you, I feel you, because had someone given me this advice in my early 20s, I don't know that I would have been fully open to it because I was the type of person who didn't like feeling like I was not good at something. So my thing that I grew up not feeling good at was math. I just kind of wasn't as quick with mental math the way some of my peers were. And so I was determined to take all these math courses in college and try to conquer it. And when I didn't conquer it or when I had to work three times as hard, it didn't actually make me feel so much better. Honestly, it made me feel dumber than I wanted to feel. And so I think there is kind of a fine line between just enabling yourself and making excuses for yourself, but also just being strategic and practical about like, maybe this is not part of where I'm trying to go. So what's the point of spending time trying to learn this thing? Now, I'm not saying that doing mental math and adding numbers isn't useful, but yeah, like some statistical stuff in my stats class is really not relevant in my day-to-day life. And looking back, I kind of wish I spent less time thinking about it in college. So when I first started to be open to this was actually when I started an internship my senior year of college. This was one of the most transformational internships and even experiences I've had. And I was super big on education at this point. I was getting ready to be a teacher and I was working for an educational policy startup in Sacramento, California for this woman, Michelle Ree, who was like the superintendent in DC who me and my dad were both like obsessed with because my dad was a principal. And I just was so excited because she was low-key like a celebrity in the education world. So I was working for her startup. And as part of our professional development, some of the women in that organization led the female interns through an activity called Strengths Finders. I am obsessed with Strengths Finders. If you've never heard of it, I think they changed the name a little bit, but it's Gallup. That's the company. And it's a paid test. I think it costs $20. And It's like an hour-long test that asks you all these very super pointed questions to help identify your top five strengths. And I remember when I got my report, two of my top five, and I've taken this several times since, and these two have never changed. My other three have changed, but these two have always stayed the same. Number one was being futuristic, which I'll explain in a second. And number two was being restorative, which is, sorry, sorry. Restorative was one of my other ones. Number two was being strategic. So futuristic means that I am somebody who is really good at visualizing things far down the line, which can kind of relate to number one that we talked about, about predictability. But I'm someone who has this strength of thinking about the future. And when I read this, I'm like, isn't everybody like that? Like, I didn't even know that this was a unique strength that I had. So I kind of felt super cool in this, like, thing that was always so natural for me, for me to finally realize, like, no, this is not natural for everybody. This is natural for you because it's a strength of yours. And maybe if you knew that, it would help you kind of leverage it. And then number two, being very strategic. I'm somebody who can solve problems very strategically instead of panicking in the moment. I'm, like, trying to strategize and figure out the best way to, you know, solve a problem so again like kind of realizing like whoa these aren't things that everyone has and conversely there's strengths that other people have that I don't have but it changed the way I viewed myself knowing that I had permission to kind of like leverage these five strengths and figure out how I can use those five strengths to help me with my career with my personal life and it also really made me realize that I had just spent the 20 years before that, just thinking about my weaknesses. Like I'd been burning all of this fuel, just trying to focus on my weaknesses that I didn't realize that I could be leveraging something I was already good at to get even better, regardless what my goals were. And so I just really wish that I had learned that sooner, but I did. I learned it, you know, kind of pretty early on and um, was able to build on it. And that's something that to anyone in their 20s or even in their 30s, wherever you are in life, it's okay to not be good at everything. It's okay to suck at some things and just delegate those things. It's okay to decide that you're not that person in your relationship or in your you know, friend group. And there's so much value to that level of self-awareness and just being able to know the things that you're good at 
And if it is something that is a weakness or an area of growth that you really, 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 really find value in growing, then by all means, grow it. But don't grow it just because it makes you feel deficient. Grow it because you actually see value to growing it. So number three, this is one that I think anyone who you know, comes from an immigrant family or anyone Arab needs to hear. Your parents and your elders are also still learning. I'm kind of like shook at how long it took me to realize this. I know it was in my later 20s. Like this was not something I really, 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 really fully realized in my early 20s. One thing I can proudly say that I realized in my early 20s is that I just need to be grateful for my parents. Like I've always felt very grateful. I've always felt like I'm not entitled to anything. They don't owe me anything. If anything, like I owe them the world and they've already done so much for me and it's up to me to try to understand them. But I still idolize them and I still put them on this pedestal, which I think was actually very harmful because when they did things that weren't in their highest self, let's say everybody does, I didn't understand that. So it would either really shock me or I would kind of toxically assume that that's how things were supposed to be. So a perfect example is, and we'll get into this in another lesson, is that our parents are kind of, our, our culture, I shouldn't say our parents, our culture is kind of judgmental. And so when our parents are judging us or kind of like reprimanding us for certain things that maybe they shouldn't be, I just assumed that I should adopt that same mentality when it came to other people. And so it took me for a long, for probably my later 20s to realize that I don't need to think that way. That's what, you know, got them here and that's what maybe worked for them or they didn't have time to get to that part of their own growth because they were dealing with so much, but I don't have to think the way that they think. And now my only living parent is my mom and it's just so cool to see my mom like growing and changing her belief systems and going to therapy which is something like I wish we could have got my dad to do that that would have been so cool to just kind of see in real life that cycle of our parents learning and growing with us and being these like ever evolving beings instead of these people who just like stopped growing and stopped changing the day they gave birth to you which when you say it out loud it sounds so self-centered and stupid like it really does and so I say this not to like say anything bad about our parents it's the opposite like I literally say this because I feel like we need to give them more grace and more empathy with how they parent or how they are in general because sometimes that that pedestal that we put them on is one that they never asked us to put them them on and is also one that kind of hurts more than it helps because we're putting we're holding them to the standard that is very unfair for any human being to be held to so I also want to say with this one, you know, that your parents are your elders or your parents and elders are also growing is one thing I learned in my latter half of my 20s is to also learn to silence those voices that I respected the most. I want to say that pretty early on, I was very rebellious and just very introspective and reflective and an independent thinker I learned to silence like the outside world and be like okay you think this you think this I'm not gonna think that I'm gonna figure it out but it took me a very long time to be able to silence even the voices I respect because at some point it is important to just like kind of like not accept that feedback for a little bit figure out how you feel figure out how you think and then engage in that conversation because I think especially as an Arab woman It was very easy for me from a young age to just like adopt the thoughts from the people that I respected the most. It it kind of was a muscle that I needed to build to just be able to like disagree, like literally just disagree and be like, no, I know you believe that and I know you're smart and I know you thought about that for a long time, but I'm also smart and I also thought about that for a long time and I'm also me. And so that doesn't apply to me. And here's why. And it took me a while to be able to have those conversations. But once I did, it wasn't, I won't say it was met with a lot of happiness at first, but I think that it got to a place of just a lot of mutual respect with me and the people in my life where it's like, I'm able to communicate the way that I think and why I think the way that I think without needing you to agree with me. I'm not trying to impose my thought process on you. I'm just telling you, don't impose your thought process on me because this is how I think and this is how I feel and this is what applies to my life. Super hard for a lot of us to do for so many reasons, but so 
so necessary and I'm so grateful that I've kind of stepped into my 30s having learned that. So this brings us to lesson number four. This is something I learned from the book The Four Agreements by I forgot who. And this is that judgment towards others is really just judgment towards yourself. Now, when I first read that, I'm like, no, like some people do things that I would never do. So I'm judging them like I'm not judging myself because I don't do that. It's not that simple. It's the idea that you think you are in a place to even judge, which like is so hard for me to let go of because sometimes I really do feel like I'm in a place to judge. And I have to remind myself like, why am I reacting like this? Like, you know, when you're on Instagram or TikTok or whatever you're on and you just see people commenting like, pouring their hearts out just like hating on something and you read it and you're like why are you so mad like literally who hurt you that's what i'm talking about it's like when you're projecting something that someone else is doing like it's bothering you so much because deep 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 down inside there's a part of you that hasn't healed from something and that thing whatever you're judging someone for is triggering that part of you even if it's not the same exact thing and it's not as aligned it's like okay this person just killed someone and now I'm so angry about how how dare they. And I'm, I get it. Like, no one should kill anyone. And so, like, we could just leave it at that. But sometimes you have this, like, emotional reaction where it's, like, because you hold yourself to such a high standard of being... Maybe the kill people was a really bad example. Let me think of something different. I'm so bad on the spot. If you watch my YouTube videos, you know I'm, like, so bad thinking on the spot. But, okay. Something very, very common in our community. So... If you're Muslim, you've probably met someone or know someone who decided to take off her hijab. The amount of judgment on these women blows my mind, blows my mind. And sometimes it's other hijabis who are judging, you know? And so I just, sometimes I'm like, okay, she did the thing that maybe you've considered doing and would not allow yourself to do for whatever reason. You, you chose what you felt was best for you and ultimately if you chose the hijab that's amazing i'm not trying to turn this into any like bullshit western liberal thing by the way so it goes both ways or when someone puts on the hijab right and women who don't wear the hijab who are muslim judge those women like it goes both ways it's like what about what you're telling yourself is making you hate this person's actions so much to the point where you need to publicly condemn them or gossip about them It's okay to look at what someone does and say, okay, that's not for me, or I personally wouldn't do that. But then it's like another level of like who hurt you when you feel the need to just like condemn them so hard. And we are all guilty of it. Trust me, I am no saint when it comes to this. So I'm, that's why I didn't say that my lesson was don't judge people because I have not learned that lesson. My lesson is that when I do judge people, I know not to believe what I'm saying. I know to kind of check myself and be like, you're judging this person so hard. You're even saying something about, about them, either to Ahmed or whoever I'm deciding to talk about. If it bothers you that much, it's triggering something inside of you. It is not about that person. <clears throat> it's about you. Now, I say this because it's like so much healthier for us to not project things out to other people, but to use that data. If something that someone did really bothered you, use that as data to help you kind of like grow from that or like heal from that. And it's kind of like this beautiful moment where you're like, that person just did something that bothered me so much. Let me take that back to me and myself. Let me have a little meeting with myself and figure out What have I not healed from that is making me so angry right now? Your emotions can really be very valuable data. Your triggers can be very valuable data to kind of help you understand what is kind of holding that power over you. And for me, one thing I've learned is that judgment is just so pervasive, so pervasive in our community. And it's no surprise. Like, don't even judge yourself for judging. It's the last thing I'll say on this point. We grew up literally in a community that just constantly was saying things about like hey de binta da 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 oh whatever like there's always heke and when you hear that over and over and over it kind of shapes the way that you start to talk 
to yourself or the way that you start to narrate the things that you see. And so don't also make the mistake that I made in trying to unlearn judgment for by judging yourself for judging because that's literally just kind of like building that muscle even more. So lesson four is that judgment towards others is really just misplaced judgment that's really judgment towards yourself. And then last but certainly not least, this is one I learned literally like a couple months ago. Self, I don't even know how to phrase this one because the way I wrote it is kind of funny. I wrote it down as actual self-care is not pizza, Netflix, and rest every day. <laughs> not saying that you can't have pizza, Netflix, or rest as self-care, okay? But I got to a point where, and I think it's because I grew up in a family and in a community that was so high achieving and it's like you have to get all a's literally like i got an a minus my dad made me go ask for extra credit so i could get an a like it was hella high achieving and just you need to work hard you need to hustle that's kind of the immigrant mentality and so it's no surprise that we're kind of slow to the self-care <laughs> train like it hasn't really hit yet for us and like our parents think it's bullshit they think mental health not everyone I think it's changing but like a lot of our parents or elders think mental health isn't really a thing so I think because I was so aware of that I didn't want to be victim to that so I just took self-care and ran with it and I'm like Rima you're feeling tired today if you want to watch the whole five season series of whatever on netflix you should do that rima if you want to uber eats every day just do that it's okay it's self-care i swear you guys it got so out of hand and i do think there's something <laughs> there's something about like being too nice to yourself and i don't i don't i don't even think it's being nice to yourself you're being so enabling that it's actually not helping and so when I started looking at my goals that I had written, like every quarter I write goals and I'm like, girl, one of your goals is to be in the best shape of your life. But then you're wanting to tell yourself like self-care is just like skipping your workout and going to get a massage. Self-care is, you know, just sitting at home and not really doing anything because you don't feel like it. No, that's not, how are you caring for yourself? How? And so I learned to start categorizing things um, I read this really awesome post by Brown Girl Therapy. She's amazing. If you like this kind of content, you will love, love her. She's on Instagram. And it kind of differentiated between self-care and self-soothing. And she said that if you are in self-soothing, it's kind of like you don't have the emotional capacity to think about proactive self-care, like going to the doctor, going to the gym, eating healthy, meal prepping. And you're in self-soothing mode because it's like kind of a reaction or an immediate relief from the problems that you're experiencing. And so she talks about how this impacts people of color, people who are dealing with trauma. And so for in that situation, a Netflix binge is self-soothing. And that's okay. Just don't call it self-care because self-care would be something that is more proactive. It's not really reactive, like self-soothing. It's proactive. And then in my case... There was also just self-indulgence like girl you do not need uber eats every day like i was not really taking care of my body i was not feeling good my back started hurting because i was just like spending way too much time sitting so one thing that i really 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 started to learn over the past several months is reframing what self-care is and just really positively reinforcing when i do get into the gym which i've been going five times a week i've been feeling so much better and just like the talk that I say to myself when I'm in the gym is like, I'm so proud of you. You're that bitch. Like, I really, I was telling myself that today. Like, you are that bitch. Like, look at you. Look at you. I'll be on the treadmill literally dying, looking crazy. But I'm just like talking so positively to myself because I want to feel like I'm doing something that is really, really caring for myself. So, whew. you guys know I can talk, but I feel very, very out of breath after this one. But anyway... I'm just so excited about this next chapter. Whoever tells you that your life ends when you turn 30, well, I haven't turned 30 yet, so we'll see. But everyone has just been telling me that like you just wake up, it's so dramatic, but you wake up the morning of the day you turn 30 and you just feel like you don't care about anything anymore. And I'm just kind of rolling my eyes because I'm like, you guys are so dramatic, but I really hope that that happens. But I've been feeling it this past week. like. This past week, I've just been feeling better. Like, I've been 
feeling less pressure i don't know what it is maybe it's because our parents and ancestors and whoever just told us that if we don't do x y and z and have 20 kids by the time we're 30 we're worthless and maybe it's because we're i'm getting there and i realize like i should just who cares maybe that's giving me permission to just relieve pressure but jokes aside i have an amazing family and community and my mom who's like literally 62 and acts like she's 30 herself so i feel like i just have and i know i have my whole entire life ahead of me so i'm closing this chapter with you all on my 20s and i'm just really 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 embracing thriving so what does that mean thriving is literally what i just talked about with self-care it's not survival i'm not reacting to life anymore i'm going to be proactive about my life i'm not you know just making excuses for certain things i'm going to focus on i have this foundation built how high can i jump that's really what i think about i think of survival as just building this foundation so you could stand tall and thrival is just like let me jump as high as i possibly can because i have everything that i need to be able to do that so that's kind of why i started this show of just being arab and thriving because i really want to talk about what that looks like given our unique background and given you know the unique ways that we think and the unique ways in which our culture even like either supports thriving or maybe hinders it or maybe both right so thank you so so much for being here for the first episode it means so much to me to be able to kind of just talk to this community especially on my 30th birthday and i will see you on the next one